Welcome everyone to the webinar, Broad Agency Announcement for Private Sector Engagement in Climate Smart Agriculture. I'm Laura Osenso with Feed the Futures AgriLink's Knowledge Sharing Platform, and we welcome you here today. For our agenda, we will be having a presentation from Bruce McFarland, Operation, Operational Innovations, U.S. Global Development Lab, Kurt Resma, Food Security Partnership Specialist with USAID, Bureau for Food Security, and Kelly Fink, the contracting officer, contracting and agreement officer with the Office of Acquisition Assistance. Throughout the presentation, please post questions in the comments box, and we'll, we will be collecting these as we go. After the presentation, the presenters will consider the incoming questions in short waves, during which time they will be muted. Please continue to post questions while the presenters are considering responses. Not all questions due to time will be answered. However, we will track each and get back to them after the webinar. Also feel free to chat with each other using the chat box. You are able to start private chats with individuals by hovering over their name and clicking start private chat. We will try to keep each pause while the presenters are discussing the questions to about 10 to 15 minutes. You will see on your screen um, an announcements box where we will go ahead and provide updates. If you have any technical issues, please start a private chat with AV Tech for assistance. You can do so by simply hovering over AV Tech in the particip participants box and clicking start private chat. With that, we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation with Bruce McFarland. Hello, everybody. I hope you're having a happy and exciting day today. Uh, we're going to start off just by giving you a little bit of background about a broad agency announcement. Uh, broad agency announcement isn't really a traditional way of USAID uh, uh, engaging with, uh, with new partners. However, uh, it's becoming more popular because it provides us with an opportunity to use collaboration technique instead of simply uh, drafting up a set of requirements and throwing them out into the market and see what response are that we can collaborate with potential uh, partners about the correct approach and, in fact, even about what the problem might be and um, what, uh, what people can bring to the table. So a broad agency announcement, those of you who are, are already participating in the process, uh, you'll know that in and of itself it's not a procurement instrument. It's not a, uh, it's not a method to, um, uh, to spend money, if you will. It is a way to communicate with the public about a research area of interest that, uh, that we have and to invite people to come to the table and collaborate about how we would uh, define the problem, how we would approach the problem, what sort of solution sets are, are available to us, how we would resource it, and, uh, and then, of course, how we would implement a solution. So it's really kind of an exciting way to do business, but it's different than the way we normally do it. So the two elements for a broad agency announcement that are, that are a little bit different for us is that it's co-create and co-design. That's what collaboration means to us. It also means co-invest as well. Um, but the two really major uh, elements are co-creation and co-designing. And they are separated by something we call a science peer review board. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, when, we get to, um, when we get to the uh, process uh, diagram that we have here. Um, but what co-creation is, is the ability of partners to get together and to determine what, a, um, what the concept would be. And it's going to generate a concept note. And that concept is where the minds get together to define what the problem is and what possible solutions are. The co-design phase is where we actually craft if there's going to be a mechanism involved, if there's going to be a relationship codified. It's during the co-design phase that we're actually going to do that. The uh, broad agency announcement, uh, because USA doesn't traditionally do these, we do them in other parts of the federal government. Uh, but because we don't do it, it sometimes makes people uh, look at us kind of askance. I say, really? <laughs> Is that what you're doing? Um, it's in the federal uh, regulations. It's uh, actually in the federal acquisition regulation under Part 35. So it's, it's a normal way for the federal government to do business. It's just not usual for us. But I expect uh, now that we have... Uh, six umbrella BAAs out uh, publicly and uh, 14 addenda out, that it's becoming more of a normal way for USAID to do business. 
I'd also like to point out that this approach, we can engage any type of organization. And the whole point is to bring a variety of organizations and a variety of um, a diverse uh, uh, set of people together to uh, engage on a problem. So what we're talking about is public and private organizations. We're talking government and non-governmental organizations, things of that nature. Um, this is great when we need to engage a host government uh, to participate in the conversation or when we need to bring in another U.S. Uh, agency uh, such as MCC or, or another agency. We want them involved in the co-creation and to be able to speak directly to partners. Um, so that's, it's, an exciting, uh, it's an exciting environment to work in. But it is about collaborating together. It's not about uh, simply uh, uh, crafting a, um, a, a PD or a, a, an instrument and funding it. It's all about the collaboration. The point is, is because it's the collaboration that drives this, then that also means it can result in all sorts of codifications of relationships. Um, that includes contracts, grants, cooperative agreements. We could use public-private partnerships. We could use MOUs. We can use multi-donor trust funds. Basically, anything that USAID uses traditionally as a mechanism can be awarded under a BAA. In addition, we can also craft uh, other non-traditional uh, instrument types or ones that we don't normally use. And one of the reasons we can do that is, again, everybody's sitting around the table collaborating together. So you can explore with people what are the best ways to transfer money, what are the best ways to get goal congruence, uh, to adhere to schedules, and things of that nature. So it's pretty exciting. One of the things that really makes this different, though, and that, that folks sometimes have a little trouble getting their head around, is this is not designed uh, to instrument. This is not designed to budget. In fact, um, if, if you really you know, dig deep into what you care about in development, you'll realize that you care about the development problem and that you recognize that the budget that we have in USAID or anywhere in the world simply isn't, gonna, isn't going to be deep enough to cover the sort of issues that we're talking about. Normally, for our development professionals, what we end up doing is sub-optimizing very early in the process and say, well, I've only got this much money, so this is all I can do. What the BAA does is it provides you with an opportunity to discuss um, with potential partners the whole inclusive problem and ways to approach it. Now, you may still, at the end of the day, have to, uh, have to pare it down to resources available, but the point is, is that you've got to do it deliberately and inclusively to figure out what the best things are that you can do with what you've got. I also would uh, remind everybody that this is not about obligating US, uh, USAID federal uh, dollars. This is about resourcing problems. So USAID federal dollars may be involved, but also other sources can, uh, can come be brought to bear. And of course, the most magnificent sources of funds are that which generate, uh, um, which generate money, you know, private sector uh, funding that, that actually moves uh, private sector organizations towards their organizational goals. That's a very good way to, uh, to resource things. It's also not uh, designed to instrument. Uh, designed to instrument means uh, that we have a habit of saying, oh, I'm going to do a cooperative agreement, so these are the elements. That's not where the discussion starts. The discussion starts with what is the development problem and then determine what type of instrument that you actually need. Okay. Um, I do want to move on to the next slide here. We're having just one little thing here. All right. In the next slide will be uh, should be our uh, my uh, my computer just went down that's why we're we're doing this. The next slide is the is the um, BAA process and so I just wanted to update you a little bit about where we're at with the process right now. Um, what you'll see is the broad agency announcement process that uh, we're using. Um, what we have right now is we are we're just about to enter into the co-create the concept. So I wanted to, uh, to bring everybody back around a little bit. Um, the um, umbrella BAA is the, is the overarching broad agency announcement. And then we issued a, a, a BAA addendum that uh, people responded to. Uh, there was an element of partner selection uh, that determined who gets invited to the table. Now, I want to add that partner selection isn't about who gets funded. It's about who is going to collaborate and co-create. 
And that's what this is all about, is collaboration and co-creation to, um, to focus on a development problem, to be able to, um, to unfetter yourself from restrictions about things about uh, um, closed-end uh, resourcing mechanisms and, and uh, things of that nature. So you get to think way out of the box. We're going to go into a co-creation uh, phase where we're going to create a concept together. Uh, those folks that are around the table will actually together create the concept for how we're going to approach this, uh, this development uh, issue, uh, define the problem in a way that makes sense to everybody, and, and define the uh, solution set going forward. Now, you're probably going to have a very rich and deep uh, conversation. However, at the end of the day, all you're doing is a seven to ten page um, concept note that says uh, basically what the problem is, what the solution set that you are going to engage in, uh, what the broad general uh, resource requirements are, and who are the right partners uh, to, uh, to engage in this. Um, so that concept note will then go to uh, an accelerator review board. Uh, that's a science peer review board is what it is. It's a group of folks that will review the concept for merit. And this is where people get a little conf confused. This is not about competing between uh, people that are collaborating about around the table. There is no competition between them. And there's no, con you may end up, it, it's possible you could end up with several concept notes, not just one, but it wouldn't be about competing between different concepts either. This is all about co-creating one grand idea, if you will, about bringing it forward. And the Accelerator Review Board is about reviewing that idea and determining whether or not it has merit, and whether or not it has possibility. They're not going to look at it for a particular, for a very discrete set of criteria because it's a concept, you know, it's just a concept. So it's a little bit different. It's going to be broad criteria they're looking for. And um, what they'll do is they'll simply green light or red light the project uh, going forward. Um, if they green light it, it means that they see that it has merit, that it has possibilities, not that it achieves particular uh, goals or requirements, but that it, uh, that it has possibilities. When the Accelerator Review Board green lights it, it'll go into a, a next decision point towards uh, management approval. All management approval is is just to make sure that uh, the USAID senior leadership uh, concur that it should go forward into co-development and the contract agreement officer concurs that it should go into co-development. Uh, this is not a long process. The Accelerator Review Board is about half a day. Uh, management approval generally is uh, about the same amount of time, so this isn't very long. Uh, very difficult uh, hurdles to get through. Um, you just should know that they're there. After that, uh, the team will go into co-development where you'll actually create the mechanisms. So we're not going to do RFAs and RFPs and things of that nature. The same team sitting around the table will determine what mechanisms are necessary um, collaboratively and what requirements, uh, how, how you're going to uh, manage the uh, implementation going forward. You'll also probably codify some mechanisms because that's oftentimes what ends up happening out of this. You don't have to, um, but you will codify mechanisms and, um, and figure out who is going to do what um, from, this, uh, from this point. Uh, when I say codify mechanisms, of course, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, if you decided that it was a cooperative agreement that you all wanted to put together, you would actually write the PD, the, the uh, program description for that cooperative agreement together. Um, you can actually write the application elements together. That's with the government. That's not over the wall, now give it to me. This means sitting at the table actually writing it. You can actually write the budget together. So all these things can be done collaboratively under this. When you passed the accelerator review board back there in the chart, that's when competition ended. That's when competition requirements for the federal acquisition regulation were fulfilled. So when you're in the co-development stage, that means um, that there isn't competition uh, sensitive information being exchanged. So it really frees people up to be able to talk things uh, through and to really look at how they really want to do um, the relationship going forward. And with that, uh, we'll have something called a convergence to signature. If there's any mechanisms that are going to be awarded by the USAID uh, um, uh, contracts agreement officer before they are awarded, all the pre-obligation requirements, all the bureaucracy that we normally have to do uh, in order to award federal funding, pre-award surveys, things of that nature, all that would have to be done. But again, 
gets to be done collaboratively. It's not a doesn't have to be done by shutting everybody down while we walk into a, some dark room and and do our magic. You can actually see it all happening. So, if nothing else, that'll make the uh, the relationship uh, much more interesting for our partners that participate. And with that, uh, after we codify relationships, um, it could be possible that we do relationships outside of the USA uh, federal. Uh, uh, obligation uh, process, and that would be fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's that's wonderful. That's gorgeous. Uh, but after that, we'll go into uh, an implementation phase. And with that, um, that's basically what the process looks like. Uh, that's what the intent of a BAA is. If you got nothing away from uh, from all that uh, listening to me talk forever, just know it's a collaborative process. All right. Uh, and so it's all about bringing about a group of people to a common understanding of the development problem and the way to bring, uh, proceed forward. And with that, uh, Kurt, uh, it's up to you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, morning, everybody. We've got a beautiful spring morning here in Washington, DC, after a very long winter. So uh, we're all in a good mood. Uh, I want to thank Bruce for taking the time to come over. Um, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to describe Bruce as the, the father of this uh, new for USAID uh, approach. Uh, so we're, we're lucky to have him in the room. And he has told us he's going to be able to stay for questions as well afterwards. So uh, we'll move forward from there. Let me, uh, let me just step back a little bit and set the, the context uh, for why we're doing this. Uh, what really is this all about? I think pretty much everybody on the line is going to be well familiar with what I call the um, the sort of three strikes problem in feeding the world and uh, in uh, by let's just say by 2050 that's the number often picked. Uh, one strike is population growth, nine billion people. Another strike is the increased uh, consumption patterns, resource heavy consumption patterns that we're expecting from the emerging economies. And of course, the third strike is climate change. How really uh, are we going to meet hunger, poverty, nutrition uh, goals uh, given those, those three strikes? So in broad terms, that's what this is about. And that is, in, a, in essence, the, the BAA overview document that you all saw before you looked at the actual addendum number one. Let me also back up a little bit and just talk for a second about Feed the Future. You'll notice that the slides are branded Feed the Future. Uh, most of you already know this, but uh, we've got a few, uh, few folks with us who are new to USAID. Feed the Future is the administration, the Obama administration's initiative to combat hunger, poverty, and nutrition issues. And it's within the context of Feed the Future, that, that overall uh, multi-agency US government initiative, that we're launching this particular activity. And again, then, on the third bullet, let me just talk for a second about USAID structure for those who are new. Um, USAID is highly decentralized. We have a presence in around 100 countries around the world. We have full-fledged field missions in, in many of those countries and uh, 20 to 25, depending on, you on how you count, have Feed the Future programs. So as we here in uh, USAID Washington look at where we can add value to what our decentralized, empowered field missions are doing, we always have to ask the question, what's, uh, what can we do that's, that's in addition to or brings value to our, to our field mission structure? We have in Washington several pillar bureaus. Uh, there's a Bureau for Global Health. There's a Bureau for Democracy and Humanitarian Affairs. There is a bureau called E3, which deals with education, environment, and other issues. And then where you are now is the Bureau for Food Security. Uh, this is the, the part of USAID that's charged with implementing the Feed the Future program. And I should have mentioned earlier that USAID is the lead US government agency for the Feed the Future initiative. So this is sort of um, point central for implementation of, of Feed the Future, the Bureau for Food Security. And uh, my colleagues and I work specifically in what's called the Markets, Partnerships, and Innovations Office of the Bureau for Food Security, where we work a lot on issues of partnership with private sector and other entities. 
So linking back then finally to uh, the addendum to the BAA, so the broad BAA deals with climate smart agriculture writ large. This particular addendum, which, uh, which we are talking about now, is the intersection of climate smart agriculture and private sector engagement. The central research question is how can we do a better job of engaging, encouraging investment by uh, encouraging appropriate business practices, et cetera, uh, with regard to the private sector's involvement in climate smart agriculture. Just to recap quickly on the process, a little repetition doesn't hurt here. Um, so this again is the addendum number one to this BAA. We've defined the, the research area of interest. We have received, uh, I'll come back to this in a minute, but a large number of expressions of interest. They were due, uh, due a couple of weeks ago, called through those and selected partners for co-creation. Uh, the initial concept uh, gets, gets uh, uh, written down, I guess is the best way to put it, um, in, in a concept note. And the, the team that will be formed starting next Monday, in effect, um, uh, defines the problem solution and how to, how to move forward, as Bruce said, uh, dealing, focusing always on the development issue at hand. Uh, just one second here on the slides. My computer is a little slow. There we go. Uh, as Bruce just mentioned, the, uh, the review board um, determines which concepts have merit. Senior management concurs. And uh, Kelly Fink uh, is going to be speaking for a few minutes. She represents our uh, Office of Acquisition and, uh, and uh, what's the other part of it? Assistance, there we go, sorry. Stumbled a little bit on our own acronyms um, uh, in terms of working heavily with us then on the co-development stage. I think uh, we've covered this pretty well, so I'm not gonna go through the rest of this particular slide. There we go. No, um, the, sorry, the little bit of, uh, the, the computer's just a little bit slow here is why we're uh, faltering just a little bit. Um, so uh, quickly on the, on the schedule, um, we received 126 expressions of interest uh, on April 15th. Um, we put ourselves on a very accelerated schedule for reviewing those. 12 organizations were uh, selected to participate. I think uh, 11 of those 12 are, are on the line with us right now. Uh, I think one group decided not to participate in the end. Uh, we will, we are having the introductory webinar as we speak on April 28th. Uh, next Monday and Tuesday, we will start this intensive co-creation workshop. Um, we're describing it as painting the canvas, uh, sort of filling in uh, the, starting to fill in the specifics of, of what gets, uh, what gets co, eventually co-designed. Uh, we have the rest of the month of May to finish that process. And then we will be going before the review board that Bruce mentioned on either June 1 or June 2nd. The, the basic purpose of the co-creation workshop is expressed in this slide. I don't know, need to read it all, but it's, as you've already heard, it's bringing together uh, a set of experts and potential partners to really focus in on this question of how can we have the most impact in encouraging private sector investment and engagement on the question of helping smallholder-based uh, farming systems, farmers and farming systems uh, in low-income countries with regard to climate change. The co-creation uh, workshop will be successful if we emerge with these three, these three issues. Uh, we will have uh, working groups, hopefully, that will be well-formed uh, behind the solutions. We can't take off everything, take on everything. That's why the word some appears in this first bullet, but we will uh, take on what we can with regard to these, um, with these set of issues around private sector engagement and climate smart agriculture. Move then to the development of the concept papers, and uh, by the end of the day on May 5th, hopefully have a very clear roadmap for completion of the concept papers.
this is a very quick summary of the of the agenda. Uh, we hope to get that finalized uh, in a couple of days. Uh, we're very well along in doing so, and uh, send it out to you all beforehand. This is a list of those of you who were who were online as we speak. Um, there are some groups here who have a long history of working with USAID, and there are some groups here who have never worked with USAID. And, uh, we find that to be very, very interesting and very exciting to, to have a, a, a great mix of different kinds of groups. Sure. Okay. We were pausing for just one second to let you all absorb uh, absorb this slide, uh, see who's there. Uh, we'll also be getting this list uh, out to you. And uh, I should also mention that uh, we're delighted to have uh, some additional folks on the line with us who will be participating in the workshop. We've got a couple of representatives of private companies, and we have uh, one representative of MCC, the Millennium Challenge uh, Corporation, also on the line. Just a reminder that um, that we do have very full days uh, in Washington on May 4th and 5th. Uh, we put ending at 4:30. Uh, that remains to be seen. Don't uh, don't book your flights out of uh, National Airport at 5:15 because we we may not be done at 4:30. Um, but your your uh, personal uh, and full participation is is very important. Uh, we're uh, lucky, given the uh, difficulty of room space in Washington, to have gotten some very nice conference rooms uh, for the event that includes both uh, plenary rooms and, and good breakout space. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, as you see below, we've got, um, we've got one, I think almost everyone is sending two representatives, um, I believe, uh, from the selected organizations. Uh, we've got a half a dozen USAID staff who will be uh, following us through this process and helping out. And then uh, both private sector uh, representatives and uh, MCC. So just to recap of some of the essential points, um, as, as Bruce said, it's about the ideas first. Uh, we then go to any specific activities that emerge. But let's remember, uh, I'm not sure I like this word, ideation, but it's being used a lot these days. Uh, and it really is about uh, getting the, the focus on the development problem first and letting the activities follow from that. A reminder also that the, uh, the ideas that you have at this point in time that you may have submitted in your expressions of interest are not necessarily what will come out the other end. We expect a substantial evolution of those ideas over the course of the workshop. Collaboration is, in fact, paramount. Um, in many cases, in normal USAID processes, I think the reward structure is more on the competition side of the equation. In this process, the reward structure is more on the collaboration side of the equation. It's also important uh, to remember that as we move into this process, any activities that get designed will need to build partnerships into them. It's not the rigid rules that some of you are used to in the, in the GDA APS, for example, on partnerships, so one-to-one -one leveraging and all of that. But partnerships are very important. We do encourage participation and uh, even additional funding sources at various points in the process. And there will need to be a learning agenda built into the concept notes. So let me wrap it up there. Uh, we will be sending a package of uh, background reading out to you and encourage you all to make sure you've gone through that uh, before next Monday morning. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly, who's going to just introduce herself and say uh, a couple of words about the, again, about the sort of um, OAA, Office of Acquisition and Assistance uh, side of this equation. Kelly, over to you.
Hi, we're just waiting for Kelly, so just wait one moment, please. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Perfect. Something happened. My microphone disconnected. Um, so, hi, I'm Kelly Fink. I'm, I, I guess you didn't hear any of what I was saying, but I work in the Office of Acquisition and Assistance. I specifically support the Bureau for Food Security and the Office of Markets, Partnerships, and Innovation. So if you worked with MPI before, you might have seen my name. Um, I've been along for the whole ride here with this broad agency announcement, um, which means, you know, very beginning of us learning what a BAA is, just like you probably did the same thing, saw a broad agency announcement pop up on grants.gov or FBO and went right to Google and said, hey, what is this all about? Um, what does this mean for me? What, what are the next steps? Um, so, so really, a broad agency announcement, like Bruce mentioned, is something that the FAR and federal regulation does allow us to do. Uh, if you were to go to the FAR, it's specifically under FAR 35.016, and it's a, a competitive option for basic applied research and development that's not for major systems. We're not building airplanes here. Um, but it is research and development. So we're also not coming up with a polio vaccination because we already have a tried and true super successful polio vaccination as long as people are taking it. Um, so that's why we were very clear in our BAA that we want new ideas and we, we're giving you the problem, we're all going to come together and we're all going to work on it. Um, but it isn't traditional competition in the sense that you should feel like anybody in that room with you is a competitor. Um, just by applying through your uh, expression of interest participating in this convening session, this workshop, um, coalescing ideas around a concept note, your full and open competition is satisfied. And it's expressly noted in FAR Part 6.1 uh, that one of the other forms of competition under full and competition is satisfied through the issuance of a BAA and through a technical or peer review board, a scientific review board, which you saw in our diagram will come along after the workshop process, after concept notes has come for, have come forward. Um, so I'll be there. I'll be there for, for the long haul. But you'll probably see most of me after that period of time. Once ideas um, have to be codified into an award, if that's the route that's taken, I'm going to help everybody through that process of deciding the best mechanism, um, satisfying all those pre-obligation requirements, getting pre-award audits done if necessary. Um, and, and, you know, helping to ensure that everybody understands that really what we're, what we're looking for here is um, technical merit, um, importance to agency programs, and funding availability once the time comes. So it's not about competition with each other. Again, it's about finding awesome new innovative solutions with a great group of people to, to kind of really solve this problem or come with good ideas that might solve this problem. Um, so. I'm here for the long haul. I'm here with uh, Kurt and Bruce and the rest of the BFS and um, lab team. And I'm going to turn things back over to Kurt. Our presenters, uh, we will now go ahead and take the question and answer session. And as stated in the introduction, we'll go ahead and pause so that the presenters can consider any of the questions and then come back line in about come back online in about 10 to 15 minutes to give a series of answers. So please go ahead and type any and all questions into the chat box and we will be considering them here in the back end. Thanks so much. Hello, welcome back. Thank you for your patience. We have gone through several of the questions. Some of the more straightforward ones are already posted uh, in the questions to be addressed on your screen. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kurt to start going through other questions. Kurt, here you are. Thanks again, Laura. And um, um, 
I guess I was going to say welcome back, but I guess it's us that's coming back. You all have been there all along. <laughs> um, some of these, uh, some of these are easy and simple, and we've already posted them. Uh, others uh, require a little bit more thought. We'll get through as many as we can. Uh, if we can't get through them all, they're still coming in pretty rapid fire. Uh, we will give you all written responses so, later on. So yes, uh, please, uh, please book your travel to make sure that you are in the room in the Ronald Reagan Building, uh, Federal Triangle Metro stop uh, at 8:30. Um, on Monday morning, and we will give specific instructions. But uh, just bring photo ID, and uh, and we'll give you specific instructions from there in terms of getting into the building. Um, so this is we're looking at this. I'm looking at the question from Michael Oppitz on how long the process is likely to take. Um, this is round one. We're not quite sure yet about additional rounds, um, but we would hope that uh, three or four months would, would wrap up uh, the process for round one uh, before the start of actual implementation of activities. Going on down the question, um, the aligned countries under Feed the Future, as opposed to the focus countries, um, has always been slightly squishy, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, but there are a number of countries that are aligned. I'm not quite sure. I haven't clicked on that link lately myself to what extent they're, clar they're clarified. But we will, uh, we will go into that uh, in, in a written response. Uh, how many uh, concepts are likely to submitted, be submitted to the review board on June 1st or 2nd? Uh, this entirely depends on the workshop process and what comes out of it. Uh, theoretically, there could be none. We would hope there would be two or three, uh, and there could be more. Uh, Kelly, I think you were also going to just add a word about uh, what we mean by the concepts not being fully correlated with the number of mechanisms or not necessarily sure, absolutely. fully coordinated. Um, do you want to just yeah, jump in so on that one? Yeah, so what we note is the number of concepts does not necessarily correlate to the number of mechanisms. And I know that that in and of itself isn't immediately clear if you can't envision possible scenarios. So we just wanted to note that it could be, um, for example, that there's one concept with multiple components. And so one concept actually results in multiple awards. Um, that's entirely possible. It could be that it, it you know, one concept results in you know, three awards that fall under the, the specific competition purview of this, but then there's a very specific service requirement that's, you know, something that you just buy off the shelf. Um, but it also could be that you have multiple concepts that um, are actually closely enough linked that they can be implemented through one award by a consortium of partners. And this is an example that we're actually, um, we've seen in the past with uh, addendum to BAA with within USAID because there was multiple concepts that were just closely enough linked that the, the the decision was ultimately made that they could work closely enough together and better in fact if they were a consortium un, under one award so this is kind of what we mean here um, about a concept necessarily not necessarily correlating to the number of mechanisms but I think we also noted that sometimes a concept is not even necessarily resulting in the award because the idea doesn't necessarily require um, a cooperative agreement action or a contract action. Um, the action could be taken in such a way that that's not necessarily true, or maybe a partner setup um, comes to comes in, in place outside of aid specifically. You know, the partners that decide together come together to fund or or um, put this together. USAID is not a funding partner, or like I said, the action that. It results is not one that would necessarily be traditionally covered under a, a mechanism like a contract or a cooperative agreement or a grant. Um, so there's a lot of different scenarios that could happen. Um, so we don't want you to think in terms of, like we mentioned before, um, we're not building to a mechanism and we're not building to a dollar value. Um, the idea is, is to kind of think outside the box. Thanks, Kelly. Um, on the next question, uh, again from Michael Oppitz, um, yes, the criteria were listed in the addendum. We're typing fast here. Um, I don't think we meant quality of nominated participants. I'm sure that all the nominating participants are of excellent quality. Oh, OK. I'm sorry. I thought that this was uh, visible. 
Okay, uh, this is a question from Michael Lopitz on the, which just disappeared. <laughs> Sorry, technical problems. Here we go. Question is, what are the main criteria applied for putting together the interested group of partners for this process? So the answer is, they are the criteria that were listed in the addendum that you all responded to. Um, the idea itself, the potential for the impact of the idea, uh, the experience of the organization involved, and the ability to participate. In addition to that, however, we got a lot of really, really good expressions of interest, far more than we can handle in this, uh, in this round one. So we also had to apply a criteria of what our priorities were for the office managing the process. Um, so it's a combination of, of those criteria. Uh, we're going to go on in one second to the next question. And I think it should be noted that when we say that, that's why we we talked about how there this is round one. There might be future rounds. Um, so that's where that was applied. Just who we selected into our first um, set of workshops. Right. Thanks, Kelly. A uh, question from World Cocoa Foundation on the role of the private sector in this process. Uh, we, I just want to point out that um, if, um, almost all of you are well aware that USAID has a long history of working with private companies, so, so that's not what's new. Uh, for this particular process, uh, however, which is new to all of us, um, the role for the workshop itself is primarily going to be a role of consultation and advisory uh, and bringing the perspective of uh, private companies to the process. Uh, so that really is going to be the, the focus for this, for this particular workshop uh, to be determined later uh, as, as the concepts uh, take shape and, uh, and there may or may not be private company interest in, yeah, so in participating the addendum in a more specifically direct partnership the, sort of the, role. The broader BAA is about climate smart agriculture and this specific addendum is about you know coming, coming up with solutions to the, to the problem of increasing um, private sector engagement. So we don't want to think about the BAA as the end it's a, or, but rather a means to the end. So you're not coming to the workshops to to find your private sector partner. That's it's it. We're, we're all coming together to solve the problem of increasing engagement um, as it applies to to climate smart agriculture. So so that's that's not a a given. There's not a given that we're bringing private sector partners in as as your funding partner or resource partner but rather you know they're they're just another partner in this broader conversation they've got a lot of input to be brought and it could be that partnerships more direct partnerships do arise but um it it's the workshop is not is not the end game it's a means to a solution Great, thanks for this first round of answers. We're gonna go ahead and pause for the next 10 to 15 minutes to consider the next set. Thanks so much and stay tuned. If you have more questions, please use the chat box. Great, thanks everyone. I hope you've all been putting additional questions in the chat box and maybe even talking to each other via private chat. We're ready to come back online with our next set of answers. Kurt? Okay, uh, for this round, uh, the first question is, uh, is it the vision that participating groups would collaborate on joint concept notes with each other? Or that there would be brainstorming and participants would co-create with USAID? The answer is essentially all together. Uh, we do expect that there will be breakouts uh, during the workshop along certain themes, uh, but essentially it's, it's co-creation together, not uh, USAID co-creating with individual specific uh, organizations. Uh, next question has to do with uh, finalization of the concepts uh, after the workshop. 
and there's a specific part of this question that says who's going to be in charge. Again, the answer is it depends very much on the way the collaboration develops. Uh, we expect that there will be a natural leadership that will develop in the collaboration process, um, but uh, we cannot predetermine and don't want to predetermine who's going to be in charge post post workshop. USAID will be participating. Absolutely, USAID will be very much part of the of the process as a participation participant in co-creation. Right. Okay. Uh, next question is, um, would a partner invited to the co-creation in your expectation also play a role later in co-design and implementation? Yes, absolutely, is the response. Uh, it's all about the, the partners in co-creation continuing to work, uh, continuing to work after the, after the workshop in co-design and implementation. That assumes, of course, that uh, those, uh, that group that comes to the workshop are still involved post-workshop. Uh, there are some possible scenarios where not everyone would choose to continue to be involved uh, post-workshop. There's a question about the makeup of the review board and whether the concepts will be judged on business soundness, development soundness, or scientific soundness. Uh, the answer is, is all the above, uh, very much so. Uh, it's about those factors. It's about the technical merit. It's also about funding availability, of course. We have to be realistic. And it's about the relevance or the priority of the, the agency programs that, uh, that this particular part of the Food Security Bureau uh, is working on. And in, ter in terms of the, the makeup of the, the review board, it's going to be, f it, it'll be people who are not, who are outside of the, the collaboration process. So you won't find me on the review board. You won't find Kurt on the review board. Um, it'll be um, independent experts from within USAID, potentially from other agencies that have a, a stake, maybe other organizations. But it will be people outside of the collaborative process, so they will not have seen the concepts before. Um, they will, they will have had no role in the selection of organizations to participate in the workshops um, and the expressions of interest. So they're meant to be uh, an unbiased uh, scientific review board. Thanks, Kelly. Next question is, um, where are we at here? Oh, thanks. Okay. I understand that the discussion, the question is, I understand that the discussions don't work to any set budget figures, but are there any parameters? Uh, at this point in time, the answer is basically no. Um, obviously, we wouldn't be involved in this process if there weren't some funding uh, that, we, that, we have, uh, that we have in mind, but there could be a number of different sources of funding that come into the process over the, over the course of the design work. The next question says, does USAID have a balance in mind reaction and implementation versus the learning agenda? And the response would be that really does depend entirely on the outcome of the collaboration. It's possible that an activity that gets designed is all about the learning agenda. Uh, so again, that, that will depend on the way things develop uh, during the workshop. Uh, Bruce or Kelly, do you want to take the, the next question? Sure, am I up? Yeah, okay. Uh, the next question is, are we able to pull in other partners to the development phase who are outside of the selected 11? Now, we get this one a lot, and it's a very, very complex question. So it's difficult to answer unless you're talking about a specific organization and a specific need. So the simple answer is it depends. It's possible to do so. There's nothing that, that outright precludes it. But it depends on whether or not the, the people coming in would be potentially funded with U.S. federal funds. It depends on whether they would be on a natural uh, competitive footing or if they're naturally non-competitive. Um, so there's a whole bunch of factors involved. It also depends on how you want to bring them in. Um, so uh, what I would do uh, for this question is I would keep your mind open about who needs? Who is the most effective person when you're in your collaboration? Who's the me most effective people to do these sort of things? And if it includes an organization outside of your collaboration, then bring that to the conversation and talk it through. So that's the way to approach that one. Thank you very much. 
And, and just to add, uh, I think, Bruce, you're speaking about post-workshop. For the workshop itself, it's limited to the organizations that are, that are participating in this webinar. Uh, there's another question about, can I invite one or more persons from our team? I'm sorry, one more person from our team that I think would be valuable. Uh, we've limited the workshop just for purposes of uh, uh, room size and, uh, and format of the workshop. We've limited it to two per organization. So uh, please don't have any more than two per organization. We already have the names, I believe, in, in all cases of those who are participating. Great, that ends our round two. We're going to go ahead and move into round three with another 10 to 15 minutes. Please keep your questions coming if you have additional ones. And feel free to chat with each other. Thanks. Hi, welcome back, everybody. We've gone through the next round of questions and are going to start verbally going through them. Thank you again so much, and here we are. Put your seatbelts on. Hi again, everybody. Um, so let me just read through the, the next group of questions and, and respond as we go. First question, can you clarify whether the two people per organization must remain the same for the entire process, or can there be broader teams at later stages? I would just say, first of all, for the process to work effectively, uh, we do need consistency regarding the people involved. So it really is important that the people who are at the workshop stay with the process uh, through to the end. That said, depending on the nature of the activities that, that come out and the collaboration moving forward, we do think that it's likely that uh, additional groups from the organizations involved and possibly outside will be brought into the process. So there is the possibility of broader teams as long as we have consistency, uh, uh, those at the workshop following through the process. Next question, how do you see the process working for development concept notes Developing concept notes in May, especially for agencies not based in DC. Once again, I'm sorry if, uh, if a lot of our answers sound the same. It depends on the collaboration. Um, but one would certainly expect that there will be uh, a variety of communications opportunities post-workshop in, uh, in the age of IT communications uh, for participation going forward. Uh, sure, Bruce. Yeah, I'm, the reason Kurt's laughing at me, I'm the one who keeps saying it depends on the nature of the collaboration. Y'all are thinking some great thoughts on this, uh, but most of this is, uh, a lot of these things are conversations that you would have at the workshop. This is supposed to be an open forum for the people there uh, to really think through these things and to have wide latitude in being able to figure out what's best for the development problem and, and uh, the implementation going forward. So. Um, it's, I, I don't want to be the guy who uh, keeps saying it depends. All, well, actually, I do want to be the guy who keeps saying it depends all the time. Uh, and you all can laugh at me for that. But, uh, but it really is about trying to keep you guys out of, of uh, being stuck in a box and giving you some latitude and freedom to think widely about how you want to approach this. So we're going to say it depends on collaboration a few more times. But it's a good thing. All right? Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Next question. Given that each of the 11 participants come with their own ideas, do you anticipate that three or four clusters of ideas will emerge for approval? So uh, again, as Bruce says, <laughs> it depends. Uh, if you ask me personally, I would say it's probably likely, given the organizations that are invited, that clusters will develop. But we don't want to in any way uh, prejudge that or predetermine what those, uh, what those clusters might be before the workshop. Next question, will we have any visibility on the ideas that others shared, or will we go into the May 4th and 5th meetings blind? Uh, no, you will not go into the meetings blind. We're going to get a full information package out to you, uh, hopefully before COB on Thursday, and it will include uh, it will include the expressions of interest uh, from the participants. Next question: Will USAID MPI be offering its own resources and/or other USG resources to clarify 
uh, the questioner says he means, or he or she means technical resources. Uh, the answer is yes, we have a number of USAID staff who are going to be uh, participating in the process uh, uh, throughout, starting with the workshop. Uh, people with uh, both uh, strong technical skills and representing different parts of the agency. And uh, they won't necessarily be limited just to the MPI team, or that group is not limited just to the MPI team. To what extent, next question, to what extent are you looking for proof of concept with these three projects versus scaled uh, development impact on the ground? I think we already answered this one. And again, it really depends on what emerges in terms of the, the concepts themselves. Next question, is USAID planning on suggesting possible partnership collaborations based on the content of the submitted EOIs? Or will the process start with a more open brainstorming and matchmaking process? Again, we are not prescribing partnerships beforehand. It will be a brainstorming process uh, starting quite open and then before very long, though, getting fairly specific. Next question. It, it is important to discuss the two questions of scale, prototype, proof of concept, scale development impact. Yes, indeed, we agree. And that's what's going to be discussed during the workshop. And the last question for this round, and then I think we are going to do one more round after this one. Uh, so the last question for this round, would you confirm that you are distributing materials uh, by this Thursday? Yes, indeed, we are. Uh, so we're going to pause at this point and take one final round of questions. Uh, and we will try to get back to you in writing for anything that we've missed. Final questions to answer polls that we'll be putting up on your screen. And with that, we'll go ahead and turn it back over to answer this last round of questions. Hi again, and uh, thank you for some easy questions for the last round. <laughs> we needed them at this point in time. First question, is the intention to focus programs only on Feed the Future priority countries, or are other aligned and other countries uh, also going to be part of the process is the essence of the question. Um, the response would be that the primary focus is on Feed the Future. Uh, the funding currently identified is, is from Feed the Future. However, um, we are not excluding the possibility that either concepts will develop that are not country specific uh, or that uh, additional funding sources may, may broaden the, uh, broaden the uh, process going forward. Uh, Bruce, do you want to take the next question? Sure. The next question is, is really typical of what we get in this environment because it seems so strange to us that how competition is defined under this circumstance. The question is, will the entire process be based on cooperation in a pre-competitive arena? And it goes on to say, as taxpayers' money might be used at some time, I'm wondering if a competitive bidding would form part of the implementation later. Um, and this is, again, a little bit of a misunderstanding. Uh, you're actually in the competition process right now. So, uh, so if you can imagine yourself sitting at the table with the, uh, with the other uh, partners, you could look to your left and look to your right, and that's not your competition. Your competition is getting that uh, concept paper through uh, the Science Peer Review Board. It is a competition about the idea, not the people and not the number of ideas. So nobody's going to compare, uh, if you ended up with several concept papers, nobody's going to compare one concept note with another concept note. They're going to look at each concept note for its merit, standing on its own for its merit, and determine whether or not uh, it, it can go forward. So that's where the competition is. So you're already in the competition. It's just not one that you're necessarily used to. I might add that USAID is also part of this competition. When we, when we sit down with you to co-create, um, the USAID co-creation team that you're with is also competing in the sense that they are participating in creating the concept note and getting this concept note past the Science Peer Review Board. So it's interesting that we're all in it together uh, moving these ideas forward. 
But that's what the competition is. So uh, let me summarize very quickly. There is not an RFA or an RFP or competitive bidding that follows on to this. Uh, once you get past the Science Peer Review Board, uh, you have completed competition. Uh, and you'll go into co-development, and co-development will be all about crafting the mechanisms or crafting the uh, however you determine you're going to go forward uh, with this process. Okay, thanks. The next question notes that uh, in a particular EOI, we proposed a consortium of four organizations, including our own. Are we to assume that by inviting us, you have invited us to represent that consortium, all four members together, rather than uh, the organization itself? The answer is yes. Uh, again, just for the practicality of how the workshop will function, uh, the organization that uh, submitted the EOI will be the organization at the table representing the other parts of the consortium. Uh, next question, we understand that USAID and the USAG in general have valuable technical resources on climate change. Yes, indeed, we do have valuable technical resources. I'm uh, personally not an expert in this field, but I'm very impressed by the experts we do have. And uh, the question goes on to say, will they be made, made available to these partnerships? Uh, the answer is yes, we have some, some strong experts who will be part of the co-creation process. Next to last question, which role do the concept notes play that were developed and selected for this round one? Um, and what's important here, I think, uh, as previously stated, is that the concept notes are the starting point. Uh, we fully expect that the process will evolve over the course of the workshop and beyond, so don't come too wedded to those concepts that you put forth in the expressions of interest. That's the starting point, and we'll see where it goes from there. And the last question for the day, can you send the concepts notes today and the rest of the package on Thursday so that we can get started with preparation? The answer is yes, we'll get the bulk of them out today. With that, I think we're through with the question, so I'm going to turn it back over to Laura. Great. Thank you, everyone, for the fantastic uh, participation. And thank you, uh, Bruce, Kurt, and Kelly for your presentations and clear answers. If you do have uh, additional questions, please feel free to add them to the chat. But more importantly, please go ahead and ask the final answer the final poll questions. Again, thanks for your participation. And we're going to sign off. Have a good day. You on Monday, bright and early. <laughs>